Hello guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Welcome to the first episode of the Trans Atheist. So here we are on July the 2nd. We just came out of Pride Month. And let's just say it wasn't what we would call a normal Pride Month. Uh, with the Supreme Court's ruling overturning Roe v. Wade, Clarence Thomas very clearly telling us in his... Um, statement as part of that ruling that he had every intention and he wants the court to go after marriage equality, the right to contraception. Um, I mean, it's honestly, we're dealing with a court gone rogue in our country right now. Uh, I know with our local pride, this was our third year doing a, uh, a pride celebration, uh, so to speak. Uh, it's a very small town, a uh, very, very red area. So we always anticipate a certain amount of uh, pushback from the community. Now, I will say in our case, um, no one showed up at our Pride this year um, as far as like the actual premises to do anything. Last year, we had a little bit more show up. Uh, we had a, a, a local church group. Um, I call it our local cult who showed up with so-called surveys. They even put the emblem for the pride organization that was doing all this on the top of it to make it look more official and used that to try to collect pride goers information. This year they did things a little bit differently. They uh, sponsored from all, all accounts. I mean, they won't openly say who sponsored this event. So I will put that in, in as a caveat, but uh, we have very good reason, based on recordings of this church, that they ignorantly put up on the web, and it was captured, that they sponsored a local event at the exact same time called a Family Fun Day. Uh, now, supposedly, the thought process here was that that was going to pull people away from our event so that they could go to the super sketchy Family Fun Day that no one would claim responsibility for, they would only say it was sponsored by local churches, and yet they were not willing to say who those local churches were. Not surprising, since we live in a predominantly Catholic community, and this is an evangelical church that doesn't exactly have the greatest um, views on anything outside of their little religious group. But, um, you know, I found that very funny anyway, because... Uh, who listening actually thinks that a group of people that were planning to go to a Pride event are going to say, well, I could go to the Pride event, or I could go to this so-called Family Fun Day? Yeah, I, I'm somehow thinking that, you know, that was not uh, in the thought process. Now, in their defense, they said that this was to give an alternative. Yeah, an alternative. How about the alternative being staying home? I mean, it's not like anybody was forced to attend our Pride event. It's not like there was some decree from the local city council saying everybody's got to go somewhere and you only got the one option here. Also, we're going to provide a second option for you. No, there was always, you know, options. We got splash pads. We got parks. You know, you could do anything on your weekend if you wanted to go to a Pride event or if you didn't. But again, it was all about making the point that they are very firmly anti-LGBT. They've posted sermons about um, basically dealing with quote-unquote gender confusion. Um, as a trans person, I know what that means. And as a side note, not at all confused, pretty confident. I mean, let's just face facts. You're probably pretty confident in who you are and not all that confused. When you literally go and, you know, have a boob job, amazingly, that, that's one of those things that's probably you're, you're, you're not exactly confused at that point. Um, but um, they did have a little group prayer where they, they prayed for all the gays. I guess they were going to pray the gay pride away. Um, um, it didn't seem to work. That's my husband laughing in the background. You'll probably hear from him at some point in the podcast as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it didn't work. I mean, amazingly, I don't know what they thought, you know, pray for it. And all of a sudden I'm going to walk out a, uh, a straight cis man. I, yeah, it didn't work for the past 40 years. I don't think it's going to suddenly start working because a group, a group of, uh, evangelical fundies, uh, gathered around at a courthouse and chanted kumbaya to some, you know, 
old man with a long beard in the sky. I, I don't know what they thought was going to happen there. But uh, going beyond our own pride event that, um, that we had, you know, I think it's really important that we start looking forward to, you know, number one, pride is a year-long thing. And most importantly, we see the turn that America is taking right now. If you don't see the turn, you're not paying attention. Every state, there are lawmakers attempting to pass these transphobic, homophobic laws. You know, in the great state of Ohio, and I say that with every bit of sarcasm that it deserves, uh, we have a number of laws that have been proposed. One is a transports ban. One is modeled after the Florida Don't Say Gay Bill. We have another one that aims to rip trans-affirming care from teenagers and anyone below. Uh, these are the same morons who think that we've got five-year-olds getting quote-unquote sex change surgeries, which anybody who knows some basics in biology alone could tell you that's not going to work. I don't know how much you know about it if you're listening, but, you know, with surgery... Um, trying to do that type of surgery, you got to have the raw material to work with. So no one is trying to support surgeries for, you know, trans kids. That's not the thing. As a matter of fact, transition for a child is nothing more than what's called social transition. That means little Johnny may decide to, you know, change their name to Anna. They may grow out their hair if they're a trans girl. They may cut it off if they're a trans boy. They may change the way they're clothing, what clothing they wear, what pronouns they use. Every single bit of that. Tell me which part of that is irreversible. I have had clothes from every style known to man. You can change your clothing style. Trust me, if you couldn't, I'd be walking around right now in a pair of Jinko jeans and, jeans and airwalks. You can change your style. They can very easily, if they decide, well, I looked at it and I don't think this is me, then they can change it back. That's the whole point. Puberty blockers. They do exactly what they say. They block puberty. They do not suddenly make you a 44 double D. They do not suddenly, you know, grow a penis. Uh, they uh, just block puberty. That's all they do. And when you go off of a puberty blocker, you'd be amazed by what happens. Puberty goes back into place. It's really simple. It gives families more time. As a matter of fact, if you think that the quote-unquote trans agenda is moving too quickly, you should be in support of puberty blockers because they give families more time to figure out what their next steps are. So, in the country right now, we're seeing all this. People are sitting back. I think that as a community, we've got to learn to be yelling and yelling loudly. We've got to look at what happened with the Women's March, and we've got to keep that going. We've got to look at what's happening with abortion rights protests and keep that going. We've got to use these things as a model. We've got to remember where we come from as a trans community, because here's a little FYI for you. The Stonewall Riots, the beginning of our movement, it did not start with a bunch of people sitting around in a circle singing Kumbaya around a campfire. It started with some pissed off drag queens and trans people of color saying we are done with this and we are going to do something about it. And as long as we sit around and we do nothing, nothing is exactly what's going to change. We've got to start speaking up. We've got to start informing not only other trans people and LGBT people about what's going on, but we have cisgender allies who don't know the truth of what's going on. They're ready to stand up for us, but they're being sold a really big load of crap and no one is speaking enough to inform them about what's actually going on in the community. They want to say this stuff about kids because kids are an easy target. Target, you want to scare somebody? You mention their kids. I also have parrots. That's what you hear in the background. And they're a part of this, I guess, too. But they're going to use kids as that scare tactic right now because that's a scare tactic that has worked for years. They used it. Anita Bryant used it. This was always part of it, and it's all based on lies and fear and deception. And what's the main motivator behind all of this? It's not just simple bigotry. That's bad enough. But it is evangelical theocracy. That's what we see right now. Our Supreme Court is not a legal court anymore. It's nothing more than a church council 
giving us some evangelical de decrees on how we need to live our life. They're using the Constitution. They're interpreting the Constitution. Yeah, I'm calling bullshit. When you can actually look at that and try to say that there is some constitutional reasoning behind forcing a 12-year-old rape victim to carry a child to term, then I'm going to say that you're completely and totally full of shit. When you can look at it and say there's constitutional reasoning to not support the rights of people to marry simply because they happen to be of the same sex or gender, I'm going to call you on your bullshit because the Founding Fathers didn't mention anything about that. And while we're at it, let's talk about this whole concept of how we we revere these holy Founding Fathers. Okay, the Constitution has got to be a living document. Anybody that doesn't think it is, frankly, you've lost your mind. Because the men who wrote it, and yes, I did say men, were a bunch of white dudes in powdered wigs who owned slaves. Not only did they own them, Thomas Jefferson, the chief architect of our Constitution, is also very well known for, well, let's just say he had a couple of kids with one of his slaves. Their, their descendants are still around today. So these are not exactly the people who are of such high regard. They had some good ideas mixed in with a whole lot of shitty ideas. And we've got to reform things as we move along. That's something we've always talked about. E shit, even Ronald Reagan talked about how we needed to become that shining city up on a hill. And that man was a complete and total douchebag. So it's not like we can't change things. But we've got to have the guts. We've got to elect politicians who have guts to change things. And that does not mean simply that we're voting against Republicans, although that's a damn good place to start. It also means that we've got to hold weak Democrats accountable. We've got to hold the mansions of the world accountable for the fact that they go in as a Democrat and they don't support any aspect of our Democratic agenda. We've got to hold the... Uh, cinemas, the all, you know, all of these people that go in there claiming to be Democrats, and yet they do nothing about Democratic principles. They want to hold up the way we've always done things. Well, the way we've always done things, it ain't working no more. It's broken. And I'm a big believer that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But this one is broken. It needs some fixing. So we've got to start doing something about it. Part of that means the end of a filibuster. Another part of that means judicial reform throughout this country, but especially on the Supreme Court. So that was just a little bit of the first episode that we're going to put out here talking about what's going on. I'll be a little bit more specific in upcoming episodes. We'll kind of tailor it to specific issues going on in the country. But the biggest thing I want you to take away from this podcast is very simple. It's time to get pissed off. It's time to be thoroughly pissed off that we took the time to vote in an election. We kicked out a freaking wannabe dictator. And what happened as a result of that? Not one damn thing. Nothing really improved because that dictator had already put the little dicks in control on the Supreme Court so that they could overrule any step of progress that we try to make. So we've got to be prepared to have people who are going to hold these judges accountable. We've got to get pissed off. We've got to protest. We've got to speak up. No more being a silent ally because if you're silent, you're not an ally. Speak up. Speak on behalf of your LGBT brothers and sisters. Speak out on behalf for your friends and your family who are people of color. Speak out on behalf of the women in your life who are now petrified that they could get pregnant through rape or incest or, you know, just have a health concern that the pregnancy can literally kill them and yet they'll be empowered to do nothing about it. This is a return to 1950s mentality and if you you know, idolize that time period, then you haven't read up enough about it because the 1950s mentality might have been great for a bunch of straight white men. It was not good for women. It was not good for people of color. And it sure as hell wasn't good for anybody who wasn't straight white Christian. So 
What we want to do is we need to progress forward, and part of that progression is supporting progressive candidates and holding all of our candidates accountable. Thanks for tuning in to the Trans Atheist, and uh, we'll be talking more about pride and prejudice in upcoming episodes. Thanks. Have a great day.